Scripture reading this morning comes in two parts. First part is from the book of Alma, 10th chapter, and he's speaking to a large group of people when he says, And now I wish from the innermost parts of my heart, yea, with great anxiety even unto pain, that you would hearken unto my words and cast off your sins and not procrastinate the day of your repentance, that you would humble yourselves before the Lord and call upon his holy name and watch and pray continually that you may not be tempted above that which you can bear. And thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love and long-suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts, that you may be lifted up at the last day and enter into his rest. And from Psalms 31, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that have hope in the Lord. Amen. It is uh, Jackie and I's pleasure to be with you today in a long time. And when Jason first asked me if I would be willing to come over on a Sunday morning, I said, I'd love to. Two days later, they closed down the sanctuary. Now, Jason, I didn't take that personal. Okay. And um, it was kind of unique, really, because the first sermon I gave in this church was from this platform when this was the room where we had our Sunday services. And uh, the new facility that uh, is uh, so precious to all of you and should be uh, was under construction at the time. I hadn't said anything to Jason about the topic of today, but he mentioned the word four times this morning when we were offering prayers uh, that we've been asked to offer on the day of prayer for this coronavirus that we're facing right now. And I'm going to let you discover that word on your own, but I think eventually it will become quite evident. When we talk about this topic today, it's found uh, quite clearly defined in Alma, the 26th chapter. Yea, and it came to pass that the Lord our God did view and did visit us with assurances that he would deliver us, yea, insomuch that he did speak peace to our souls and did grant unto us faith, and he did cause us that we should hope for our deliverance in him. The vision that Lehi had in the second chapter of the book of Nephi, we Look at that, and we read it several times, and every time we read it, something new and different comes forth. But it's a marvelous story of hope and faith. Those things he related to us about that, that old path with the rod running alongside of it that the people were holding on to, trying to get to that tree, trying to get to that tree to where that precious fruit was at. And we took quite uh, read, read a notice of real notice of that uh, spacious building that was off to one side. And I suggest that in our lives, all represented in this room today, that one point in time, if that was our journey, that we might have find out, found ourselves somewhere wandering off in that direction. Because even though we were trying to hold on to that rod of iron, it became slippery, that slope that we walked upon. The path was not always a plain, smooth surface. Sometimes a little rocky, sometimes up and down hill. But the rod was there to hold us onto that path. And for those who found it very difficult, they lost their way. 
Lehi had a covenant relationship between him and God. And the prime example of trust, faith, and hope. Today, some of the believers in the gospel and of a rendition of the gospel, I should say, some, there is nothing to get very much excited about. They say, don't worry, Jesus will come, but he's not coming today. Don't worry about it. He's not even coming tomorrow. Don't worry about it. When we read in Matthew 24, the one verse that sticks out among many wonderful verses in that chapter is that the Lord is coming when we think not. Now, if I was to say to you this morning that he's coming at 3 o'clock this afternoon. No, I know what you're saying. No, that's, 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 that's not going to happen. Okay, all right. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in the morning. You're not buying that one either. But you see what the Lord said is that he's going to come when we think not. If we start running all these numbers in through our heads that we're exposed to and we try to put a, a time with that, the Lord has given us a time for it, and he's given us signs for it, for a purpose. But we're not going to get the exact date or the hour. And yet some people try to convince us that they have done that. Some of our friends would say, we have no church world leadership. There are too many people out there with too many opinions about what we should be doing. And they say, what about our future? And why should we become prepared when we don't know what that future is? And they might ask, why doesn't the Lord just come? There's certainly enough problems out there. And there are certainly enough things that we are having difficulty with. Why doesn't the Lord just come? Well, when we go back to the 140th section of the Doctrine of Covenants, in this message to Israel A. Smith, it says quite clearly that the church is admonished again that all movements toward Zion and the gathering and temporalities connected therewith are within my law, and all things should be done in order. The work of preparation and the perfection of my saints goes forward slowly, and Zionic conditions are no further away nor any closer than the spiritual condition of my people justifies. I love that last line. The spiritual condition of my people justifies. When enough people have that spiritual condition within them and they truly want the Lord to come, not for their reasons, not for selfish reasons, but for mankind's reason, the Lord will come. But not until. Not until. It does break our hearts when some of our membership that we have known had given up hope. They put their heads down. Sometimes they were sad. Sometimes they were mad. Sometimes they would go to another restoration group. Sometimes they would go nowhere. They would stop going to church. God, they say, will straighten everything out. He's the only one who can do that, you know. He's the only one who can straighten everything out. God will do it. And so, I guess that takes you and I off the hook. We don't have to do anything. We just wait until he decides that the time is there. And in that period of time, we let others pass by us that we could touch, that we could talk to, that we could help. And we don't if we're a believer, that God is going to do all of it and put all of it right without our help. He wants our help. And he looks for it every day. What about our temples? And that was plural, temples. And you say, well, well uh, Paul, we don't have temples. Yes, we do. Let me read to you what it says in 1 Corinthians 3.16. 
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. In the next verse it says, If any man defileth the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple we are. We have to be careful in this day and age of those things that we let in to our temples. And we have to be also very careful about what things we let get away from us and get outside of our temple. We're no longer holding on to them. Ships at sea depend upon water to go from point A to point B. And if there's anything wrong with that ship, sometimes it takes on too much water. And when it takes on too much water, it could sink. It could be lost. And we are temples in this world, and our living temples depend upon the world to survive. It needs the world, but if it takes on too much of the world, it can sink and be lost. Have you ever defiled your temple? I have. And you look back on those times and you say, I wish I would not have done that. And the reason I defiled my temple is because I had taken on too much of the world. If we will have faith and hope to the end of our mortal lives and never give up, God will reward that patience and that diligence. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, I love those words, run with patience the race that is set before us. Each day that we wake in the morning is a new day, but each new day offers no new gospel. No new church. It is the same as it's always been. We're the ones that have to adapt to it. We're the ones that have to accept it. We don't have to create anything that we like because the Lord has created a perfect church. So what must we do? We must hold fast. We must be patient. There are temptations all over the world. We must be aware of them. And in the fifth verse of 24, Matthew, when the Lord was asked, what sign should we look for? And the first thing he said was, be careful that you're not deceived. And is there any deception going on in the world today? The Lord wants us to read the scriptures. He wants us to pray. And when it's appropriate, he wants us to fast for those things that we're concerned about. And to get rid of that excess baggage that we're carrying around, that negative baggage, we don't need that. But for decades, some of us have been dragging that around with us. We just won't let it go. Isaiah said in uh, chapter 64, verse 6, we have all sinned. We are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Every month we participate in the sacrament, and we remember the love of God. He gave his son a living sacrifice for our rags, our filthy rags and that excess baggage we have. He wants us to take that excess baggage and put it at the, faith of, at the bottom of the cross, right at the, right at the very base of the cross, leave that baggage there and walk away from it and not turn around. Keep walking away from it. Never once reflect on it again. If you've been forgiven of it, let it go. God wants to forgive you. And remember, the cross is 
not the beginning of death, it is the beginning of life for you and I. Eternal life eventually, and we know that's our prayer. With all of our heart, we need to allow him to forgive us. If we feel, listen carefully to this now, if we feel unworthy that we cannot be redeemed by the power of Jesus, to deny that healing is a sin. If we deny the power of Jesus Christ to change our lives, we're not on the, we're, we're not on the right path. We're not thinking correctly. And there are so many people that are out there today that say, well, I'm just no good. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just out of it. Those are the ones that need to know that Christ is looking for them and is hoping to turn their lives around. We must be willing to forgive and to forgive others. That long line of people that have been in our life, if we started on the left side and went all the way across with little pictures of each one of those persons, we could say, I forgive all of them, except that one right there. What they did to me, I, I can't. I just can't. And yet the Lord says that's the one you have to forgive. And it's not easy. I know it is not easy. But the Lord wants us to forgive others. He wants us to forgive ourselves by putting that baggage down. And this next verse is so huge. The first time I, I read it, it actually made me feel terrible about myself. Mark 11, chapter 28, verse. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven Forgive your trespasses. That's huge. That is huge. How many people do you know right now that person comes into your mind, you have not forgiven, and you're not going to. That's your attitude. You're not going to do it. When you pray about this forgiveness problem, remember that God has four ways to answer prayers. He can say yes. He can say no, he can say later, or he can say, do it yourself. Why would he say that? Because you have the power in some things to do it yourself. Oh, yes, you've got to ask God for help, and he's willing to do it, but he is not going to go to the person offended and ask them to forgive you. You have to do that. That's where you come into play. He'll help you with it. He just won't do it for you. Is there any hope? Romans 5th chapter. Therefore, in being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. In the scriptures, God tells us that the holy city will be, and it will be for a thousand years. And when we read the last three chapters of Revelation, we discover that there will be mortals and immortals in that holy city. It's an unusual thing to think about. But for a thousand years, this is going to go on. And it will be a place, as described in Doctrine and Covenants 3b, prepare ye, prepare ye for that which is to come. And so let's look at that thousand-year city for just a moment. Where will it be? Where will that city be? In the 57th section of Doctrine and Covenants, it says, Hearken, O ye elders of my church, saith the Lord your God, who have assembled yourselves together according to the commandments, in this land, which is the land of Missouri, which is the land which I have appointed and consecrated for the gathering of the saints. Wherefore, this is the land of promise and the place for the city of Zion. Behold, the place which is now called Independence 
is the center place. The center place of what? The holy city. Zion. The holy city. Zion. For a thousand years. Who will be there? Matthew says, and now I sh show unto you a parable. Behold, wheresoever the car carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So likewise shall mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. That particular verse bothered me for a long time, and it just didn't seem to make any sense to me. And not too long ago, person who had studied quite a, quite a person who knew a lot about birds said that, you know, eagles, they like to kill their own dinner, and they don't look for someone else's dinner to eat. They are not scavengers. They are not vultures. They kill their own prey, and they eat their own, and they don't look for others. They're always looking for life, not something already dead. In this verse, the carcass is the church. And you are that carcass. You are part of that carcass. The Lord sees life there yet. Even though it may look like it cannot happen, the eagles are gathering there. The strength is gathering there. They know there's life there. I'm so encouraged about that when I finally understand exactly what that meant. And it says this gathering process will be from the four quarters of the earth. Then shall be fulfilled that which is written. This is, Math this is Matthew 24 again. That in the last days, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken and one left. Two shall be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. And what I say unto one, I say unto all men, watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Well, those verses 47 and 48, one will be there and one taken, one there and one taken. Many of our friends out there in the Christian world say, there it is, there's the rapture. No, no, I just told you what it is. He's gathering those elect that he wants in that holy city. He's gathering them from the four quarters of the earth for that period of time. And when he does that, there's going to be people missing, but they're not going to be in a rapture situation, but they are going to be in a blessed, wonderful, marvelous condition. It's going to be wonderful, but it's the gathering process. What is the purpose of this holy city? This is really great. I love this. And great tribulation shall be among the children of men. We've got one now. We're, we're going to get through this, but it is one of them. It's a type of may, what we, we may see in the future. But my people I will preserve, and righteousness will I send down out of heaven. He did that. He did that already. Jesus Christ, he sent down to the earth. And truth will I send forth out of the earth. You have a copy of that in front of you, possibly. You're carrying that. Out of the earth came the Book of Mormon. And what did it come out of the earth to do? To bear testimony of mine only begotten. This is in Genesis 7, 69. His resurrection from the dead, yea, and also the resurrection of all men. And righteousness and truth will I cause to sweep the earth with a flood to gather mine own elect from the four quarters of the earth into a place which I shall prepare, God shall prepare, a holy city that my people may gird up their loins. Listen to this next sentence carefully. That my people will gird up their loins and be looking forth for the time of my coming. Jesus Christ is sitting at a table with them, preparing them for his coming. His coming. His conquering. Coming. I believe that with all my heart. And these holy people in this holy city will be called Zion. And there shall be mine abode. God is talking. Mine abode. And it shall be Zion, which shall come out of all creations which I have made, and for the space of a thousand years shall the earth rest. And it came to pass that Enoch saw the day of the coming of the Son of Man in the last days to dwell on the earth in righteousness and his face for a thousand years. Are we saying that in Zion, the holy city, that God and Jesus will be with the people? 
We're only repeating. We're only repeating what God has already done. Remember the story of Enoch. And John saw what he saw and what he wrote in Revelation. I'll come to this part about Enoch in just a second here. In Revelation 21, it says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, this is what we are told in the scriptures, and it is not a new approach by our Heavenly Father. It is not a new approach for this to happen. Here we go in 7th chapter of Genesis, again up in the verse 75. And I, the Lord, showed Enoch all things, even unto the end of the world. And he saw the day of righteousness and the hour of their redemption. And all the days of, the, of Zion and the days of Enoch were 365 years. I love that number, 365 years. And Enoch, here it is, and Enoch and his people walked with God. God's done this already. He's already had a place where he's walked with the people. And he's going to do it again. Well, what about Satan? Revelation 20. And he will be cast into the bottomless pit and shut up with a seal set upon him, and he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosened for a season. Revelation 28. And he will go out to deceive the, nation, the nations once he's released, which are in the four quarters of the earth, to gather them together to battle the number of whom is the sand of the sea. Can't even imagine. Can't wrap my head around sand of the sea. It's a lot of, a lot of particles. Matthew 24, 32. And again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, or the destruction of the wicked, and then the final judgment, of course. Now, the, this is my thinking about this. Remember, I said it was my thinking that the gospel will be preached in all the world. During that thousand-year reign, who is bound? Satan is bound. He has no way to cast evil upon the earth. He has no way to stir it up in the hearts of men. What better time to go out of those 12 gates and go into all the world with the missionary groups to all those people that are still outside those walls of that holy city and do missionary work to bring them back into the holy cities? It says the walls will expand as the numbers grow. The walls will expand, and they have to come from someplace. They have to come from someplace. And what better time for it to happen than during the thousand-year reign? Because it says quite clearly in 32 that the end will come when the gospel is preached in all the world. The gospel has not, to this date, been preached in all the world. And in some places you go, I can think of three places where if they see you with the Bible, you're probably not going to see the sun come up the next day. You're not going to survive that. The gospel has not been preached in all the world, but it will be. And when that happens, the end will come. And the destruction of the wicked. Is there hope in the holy city? You know, I've had some of my students, I have several. When I say my students, I mean the CPRS uh, students, I call them my students because I see them all the time and, and I love them and they're great and they do wonderful things. And uh, I had some of the high school kids uh, talk to me one day in a class. They were asking me about uh, that uh, hope for the Holy City and what they were, what, I said, well, are you depressed about that? And they said, we don't really think there's any future. I said, what are you talking about? Well. My parents and, and grandparents, that's all they talk about is, is it's going to come to an end. It's going to happen soon. And we can't stop it. It's, it's going to be there. And I'm thinking, I'm never going to be married. I'm never going to have children. I'm never going to be a grandparent. And I never thought about that before, uh, thinking about the, that concern that they had. There's no future for families they felt that way. And when we read the Doctrine and Covenants especially, and we find in other places, it talks about this very subject. And I'm going to mention it in just a moment, so hang in there. Who will come to the holy city? That's our next topic. 
Well, one that's, that we know that those that are residents of paradise, they're coming. And who's one of those that's coming? You want to feel unworthy? One of those that's coming is, was one of the thieves that were on the cross next to Jesus. He's going to be coming with them because he went to paradise on the day that he died. All those from paradise are coming. Enoch's holy city is going to come. Isn't it wonderful to think that in the book of Genesis, there we find that holy city that, uh, uh, we've, that was taken away from us, Enoch's city taken away. It comes back again in Revelation. In Genesis, the tree is taken away from us of life. It comes back in Revelation. I don't think that's an accident. God was involved with putting that book together as we know how precious it is to us. They'll be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. We know that. And in Doctrine and Covenants 43, it says that the righteous will change in the twinkling of an eye. And children, and it talks about infants coming up here, and children shall grow up and be pure. There is no sin in this holy city. There is no such thing. It's a celestial atmosphere. They will grow old and they will die and shall not sleep, but shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the age of man. Now, the age of man is determined to be 72 years. And you say, where did you get that? Third Nephi, 13, 13. Can't hardly forget to have a lot of trees in there. Read that. It tells you exactly that that's what it is. Doctrine and Covenants, 98.5. Infants, if there's infants, brothers and sisters, with those mortals that are in that holy city, there's going to be marriage. It just makes sense. I don't think the Lord wants to go another direction with that. There's going to be infants. And they're going to grow to that age. And they're not going to die. They are not going to die. They are going to live with him forever. And they will be changed in that twinkling of an eye when they reach that age of 72. So when I'm talking to our students again, I say, you, if it comes today, you will never die. As a mortal, you can be married. It seems to make sense. You can have children and grandchildren, and for a thousand years, it can be great, 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 great grandchildren. How many do you think that might add up to over a thousand years? It's a promise. The Lord has said those infants are going to grow up, those children are going to grow up, um, and it's going to be a marvelous place. Doctrine and Covenants 45. The New Jerusalem is a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. And it shall be called Zion, and it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations, and shall come to Zion singing with songs of everlasting joy. What a celestial atmosphere that will be. Now, beloved, I would say to you that we need not to be afraid of this. this is not, God doesn't want us to have fear about the life to come. God loves us, and he's kind to us, and he's patient with us, and he created us, and he wants us to live with him forever. He wants us back with him. In our house, when something new comes to the house, and you know this routine, you get it out of the box, and you look at it, and you start to read the instructions, and it says something like, whisk tab A, put it into slot B. Turn the number six metric screw four and a half times to the right. Do not over tighten. If this does not work, refer to the owner's manual. If you're still having problems, then call our factory rep and he will set you straight. Does that sound familiar? Brothers and sisters, here is your owner's manual, right here. And you know what? Some assembly is required. And when you look inside of here, every tool that you need to be successful in building a world that we're looking forward to come, it's all here. It's all here. All those tools are there. All those directions are there. And if you get lost somewhere along the way, get down on your knees and call the factory rep and see what answers you get. 
see how he helps you out with that. And whatever you do, do not let the warranty lapse. Stay current with it. Don't let it slide away from you. Keep it current and active. Hold on to those scriptures. Let us look up and call upon our creator. Here's what our creator has done for us. He's created you and I. He gave us life. He taught us how to live. He died for us. You have offered to take away Jesus, our sins, our rags. You want to be with us for eternity. Thank you for your gospel. And Heavenly Father, thank you for your necessary sacrifice of your son. Why wouldn't we do what the Lord wants us to do when he says, give us those filthy rags. Give them to me. Walk away. Don't look back. Our God is the God of light, love, and power. He's a God of blessed assurance. While we have life, it is not too late to leave the past and to break from self sometimes and sin. Hope is a gift most precious as mortals. If there is no hope in us, there is no purpose in us. No hope in us. No purpose in us. And this is not what our Creator desires. In Proverbs, the 29th chapter, it says clearly, where there is no vision, the people perish. If you have life, you have hope. If you believe this gospel, you have hope. If you believe in eternal life, you have hope. If God is your master, you have hope. Take care of your temples. Let the light come into those temples. And when you see that dirty corner, sweep it out. If you see that dusty ledge, wipe it off. You're going to find them. The more light you have in your temple, the more you can see that needs to go. But the darker it is in there, the more you don't see. And you don't need to know those things that are before you unless you're willing to do something about it. Take care of your temple. Accept your spiritual responsibilities. Forgive others. Yes, that one You've got to do it, and you've got to mean it. You just can't say it. You've got to mean it. If you have fear of the future, then you're really not paying attention this morning. God loves you, and he's only thinking about you and your welfare for now and eternity. You can't top that. You can't beat that. Be certain that God has a plan for you. And you need to share that new hope that you have, that strengthened hope within you with others while you still have breath. You need to call them. You need to write them. You need to visit them. You need to say those things that can mean everything to them. And yet you've hesitated for whatever reason there may be. At the end of each one of our chapels, and the students here this morning understand this perfectly, I often ask them to offer a silent prayer. And it generally takes about 10 to 15 seconds. And I want to do that with you. And then I'll have a short prayer. And we'll have our closing hymn. I want you to pray about something that is troubling you right now. Maybe there's a person you can't forgive. Maybe it's something about this virus that's floating around. Maybe it's something entirely different that no one in this room knows about but you. And if it's some of that baggage that you need to get rid of, you need to drop that off today and really do it the way the Lord wants you to. Walk away from it and never look back. I want you to pray for just a few moments. So if you bow your heads, and all these prayers are going to come up to God at one time. He's going to love this moment. And I
want you to take advantage of it. Let's all pray together. Father, God bless the Coburn Road congregation and bless them abundantly with hope. Amen.